Hello, uh, this is Jim Broarolas. I'm the director of the Kidney Cancer Program, and I am here with uh, Dr. Margulis, uh, one of our urological surgeons at uh, uh, UT Southwestern, a renowned uh, surgeon, as well as uh, Dr. Hammers, uh, a leading figure in uh, immunotherapy uh, in kidney cancer, to discuss with you the results of the recent Carmina trial. Uh, Dr. Margulis, would you care to summarize for us uh, the Carmina trial? I think it's a very landmark study. Um, and the design was relatively straightforward. Patients were randomized to receive nephrectomy and uh, sunitinib or sunitinib alone. And the idea was to see which group would have better oncologic outcomes. Um, uh, the primary endpoint of the study was overall survival. The question is very important since the, to this day there has been no prospective data addressing this question. Um, the study uh, showed us that uh, uh, when patients were randomized to undergo surgery and sutent versus sutent alone, um, the two arms were not inferior. So patients, patient groups seemed to do uh, relatively similar in their outcomes, uh, depending on which group they were randomized to. It's the, one of the biggest undertaking of our time to uh, try to answer the question, you know, is an advantage um, of removing the primary tumor in face of metastatic disease, meaning disease that is spread, um, or um, uh, shall we start or just pursue essentially systemic therapy? Uh, this is a trial that um, uses primarily tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, which has been the standard of care uh, for kidney cancer in patients with, uh, or patients who present with metastatic disease for the last decade. Um, um, which um, you know is valuable, um, although I would say time is moving uh, on and uh, other therapies are slowly supplanting uh, this class of drug, at least in the first line. Um, but nonetheless, it's an important study. Um, I'm impressed with uh, how the investigators uh, conducted the study and enrolled a fairly large number of patients, and I think it will be interesting to discuss the data today. The study uh, was done um, primarily in France. Any reason why a study was not done in the United States? I believe that site reductor nephrectomy has a very important role to play in patients with kidney cancer and it would be difficult, and I think a lot of investigators in the United States would feel that it would be difficult to deny patients uh, the surgery. Dr. Hammers, uh, what would you say about uh, the studies uh, that have been looking at the role of uh, nephrectomy in patients that are getting targeted therapies? that have concluded that nephrectomy uh, is advantageous. Uh, the evidence for, for the role of cytoreductive nephrectomy in the TKI era until now has been primarily been a retrospective, so looking at large data sets. Um, and um, um, we felt comfortable with the data. It uh, confirmed essentially the initial finding uh, from the interferon era. Uh, which we now regard essentially as pretty much ineffective systemic therapy. But I do think um, that there are important differences as we discuss the trials um, in what kind of patients um, received a cytoductive nephrectomy or not. Um, and I think it will be important to tease out some of these nuances between these data sets. The trial focused on patients that were in an intermediate and poor risk. Um, could you tell us what that means and the implications? Well, so um, it is very useful to, to um, uh, group patients with metastatic kidney cancer uh, into risk categories. And there are several risk categories used that basically focus on various patient um, characteristics such as performance status, certain laboratory values, um, and, um, and then uh, and the timing of uh, metastatic disease. And then you can categorize and group patients into various three distinct risk categories uh, such as good risk group, intermediate, and poor risk group in that patients in the poor risk category have very limited survival and don't derive benefit from cytoreductive nephrectomy. They simply, patients unfortunately don't live long enough to, to derive the benefit from surgery. And so it's been my practice and most of my colleagues around the country usually would not offer patients with uh, poor risk uh, features uh, a surgery. And it is interesting and, and I think uh, unfortunate to some degree that in this trial uh, half of the patients uh, were, had uh, poor risk uh, uh, features. So how do patients with uh, poor risk features do? So these are the patients we worry about the most. Um, historically, um, their survival was measured in months. Um, uh, in comparison, if you have um, intermediate uh, risk disease, your median survival 
in the TKI era is around two years and the favorable risk group almost four years. Um, so there are steep, uh, steep differences um, between these different risk groups. Uh, these patients may not benefit from surgery. There will be delay in the start of systemic therapy. Uh, they may not recover as well as other patients. Um, and I think valuable time is lost. In particular with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, they do interfere with the surgery in the sense that they will um, have to be avoided perisurgically since they interfere with wound healing. We often have to delay uh, the initiation of um, uh, these uh, treatments by several weeks. Um, so um, I, I do think these play all um, uh, well together. So, so I do think that is one of the uh, limitations of the study and I would say um, uh, most of us who are thinking you know, daily about how we can inv individualize uh, uh, treatments um, uh, feel that um, uh, um, that particular patient population probably would not have been included if we had been able to conduct a trial like this in the United States. What would you say about the limitations of this study? There are several limitations I think that are, that are worth discussing. Uh, firstly, um, the trial design, is, as we discussed before, um, included patients with poor risk disease, which I don't think should have been included in the study. Second thing is um, there were some mismatched in randomizations. There's a larger percentage of patients in the nephrectomy arm actually had larger burden, lar larger uh, higher stage tumors uh, that could have affected outcomes. Finally, um, in this study, patients with the significant metastatic tumor burden were included, and so nephrectomy did not afford significant reduction of the tumor burden. And I think those are the type of patients that we wouldn't typically recommend for set reductive surgery. Um, and so that, I think, could have impacted outcomes. And finally, there's quite a bit of crossover in, uh, in the arms of the study. And what I mean by that, patients that were assigned to receive nephrectomy and uh, sunitinib, significant percentage of those patients didn't get systemic therapy. And patients that were assigned to s systemic therapy arm only, a uh, significant percentage of those patients crossed over and actually received nephrectomy. So there's quite a bit of that contamination. So how that would have affected uh, the study is difficult to predict. Dr. Hammers, anything you would add about uh, limitations on the study? If an ICA patient and have to think about, you know, this is somebody um, I want to send to a urologist or discuss with my colleagues in, in, an inter, in, the, in the multidisciplinary setting, um, I do want to see a patient where uh, the surgery removes roughly 90% of the tumor volume. I think those patients do the best. The minimum, I would say, um, in the early trials in the 2000s, I think, was around 75% of tumor burden was supposed to be removed. Um, the uh, volume of um, metastatic deposits was quite remarkable. The median was almost as large as the primary tumor. Um, so that indicates um, that um, you know, if you remove um, whatever, let's say 50% of the tumor burden, you may not really benefit as much um, than, than if you don't. So, so um, clearly I would say this was a challenging population. Um, um, from my perspective, I am not too surprised uh, that in this particular context, um, the um, uh, systemic, meaning sunitinib only group, um, was not inferior uh, to the uh, combination of um, surgery and uh, sunitinib uh, treatment. Dr. Margulis, looks like the study on average uh, enrolled uh, one patient uh, over the course of the year at each site. Um, how does that affect your thinking in terms of uh, the generalability of the results? As, as we have shown in our center, I think the volume and the number of patients that the center treats potentially translates into improved outcomes. And we have certainly have some data to suggest to, from our kidney cancer program to, to support that notion. And so it's, it's a little bit worrisome to me that, um, you know, there's about one patient per site enrolled. So and one has to question uh, sort of what the comfort level of these centers was with management of these advanced uh, patients and how generalizable these results would be in the United States, especially at the higher, higher, higher volume centers such as ours. Multiple studies, multiple different cancers have always shown that um, if you have a particular uh, affliction of certain disease uh, that you will do better at experienced high volume centers. Um, you want a surgeon who doesn't do just 10 or 20 a year, we want a surgeon who does hundreds of these surgeries a year and um, uh, the outcome is just simply better. So volume matters um, without a doubt um, um, and patient selection matters. What are the implications uh, of this study for patients? Well, from a surgical perspective, I right now unfortunately don't see this study changing the, my treatment paradigm at least, and I'm, I'm interested in your, your opinions on this matter. 
um, uh, at, because of the limitations and um, driven by limitations of the study. I think um, my approach to these patients, and we will discuss what that is shortly, hasn't changed. So I, um, it, it's all about patient selection. I think it, that's the key here. I think selecting patients that we think will benefit from septic reductive surgery is what really drives uh, my decision making. I do think that um, if I see a patient um, who has a very large renal mass, is at risk of local symptoms, bleeding into the urine, discomfort, um, and uh, really has um, a small number of uh, metastatic sites outside of the primary tumor, small disease burden, um, a surgery can um, uh, significantly remove the tumor burden, can remove or improve um, symptoms associated with a large tumor, such as night sweats, tumor fevers, decreased appetite, um, can improve anemia. Um, so a lot of things can be done just with the surgery alone. Um, and I do think that those patients will do better with, uh, with uh, subsequent um, systemic therapy. So, so to me, that really doesn't change very much. Um, the other thing is that, um, as Dr. Magudis uh, earlier indicated, um, you know, um, all these studies typically lag um, our standard of care from a systemic uh, treatment perspective. Uh, so since uh, April of 2018, um, for these particular patients, patients with intermediate and poorest disease, the standard of care has changed uh, from an upfront TKI to now immunotherapy with combination immunotherapies. Uh, so we will see how um, this treatment um, paradigm um, evolves um, in this particular setting. So. Um, um, things are changing very rapidly. I, I still believe that um, patients who present with a large tumor burden up front, in particular with risk of developing symptoms or have symptoms or have presented with symptoms from the mass, um, uh, could do really well with an initial uh, upfront surgical approach. The original studies that led to the generalized acceptance uh, of the notion of doing uh, surgery to remove the kidney tumor uh, in patients with metastatic disease were studies that evaluated the role of surgery in the context of immunotherapy interferon. Would you in fact regard um, uh, those uh, studies as being more relevant to decision making today given that, uh, as you just said, those patients would be getting immunotherapy, then this is a study in which patients in intermediate and poor risk groups got uh, uh, ATKI. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Now, um, uh, the difference I would say between the studies conducted in the early 2000s uh, and um, um, the current standard of care is, as also Dr. Magulis indicated, is really that we had huge advances in the efficacy of um, immunotherapy. I mean uh, that we are now beating um, essentially an upfront. Um, oral chemotherapy um, is, I think, uh, quite impressive. But I do believe in that the patients who were enrolled in those studies are more reflective, I would say, of our current standard of care, of how we approach patients, meaning um, certain considerations with how much tumor burden can be removed with the surgical approach, certain selection criteria, trying to avoid poorest patients. Um, 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 I, I still believe that those studies are probably more relevant um, than this uh, particular um, have you ever experienced the situation of a patient that following immunotherapy had surgery for their kidney cancer and their kidney cancer had in fact disappeared? Uh, yes, I have, and it's, uh, it's, quite a, it's quite a fascinating phenomenon. This phenomenon doesn't happen very often. Um, and we have a, had a case of a patient who was, who was actually quite of poor performance status and uh, I didn't think that he was a great candidate for any type of operation. I didn't think that we, that we would survive the operation. And he was actually treated with um, a checkpoint inhibitor and uh, had an amazing um, uh, systemic response in, in terms of improvement of performance status. And in fact, then proceeded to have his kidney removed and um, that we didn't find any viable tumor. So I think, uh, I think that certainly adds a, a level of intrigue to, to, to the role of surgery uh, in the, uh, with effective immunotherapy, and I think sort of time will tell. If you had to estimate um, how many patients may have a complete response um, that is durable, that could be cured potentially with combinations of checkpoint inhibitors such as ipilimumab and nivolumab, what would that number be for you? So I can give you my, uh, my gut feeling. Um, um, we do know that um, 
um, with the combination of nivolumab and pilumumab in patients with metastatic disease, nephrectomized patients, meaning their primary tumor was actually removed in the vast majority of these patients, the um, chance for complete response is almost 10%. Um, so that's very sizable. Um, and then I do think that there will be another a reasonable number of patients who have a very deep response, meaning um, most of the tumor um, disappears, um, but um, there's some um, uh, little, uh, maybe some scarring or uh, maybe non-cancerous tissues left over, if you will, um, after the initial response. Um, so, so I do think that um, you know um, maybe um, up to half of the patients may actually get a very deep response and uh, my sense is that those patients are probably going to do uh, the best. Um, I think uh, we will have to follow the patients on these trials with these data sets and see how many patients will maybe never progress. I think all of us have experienced uh, patients on these therapies who've done extremely well um, who actually can come off therapy altogether and be just watched and followed. Um, so I think these are truly exciting times. I think it's the first time that um, um, you know, medical oncologists um, are more comfortable um, about the goal of curing patients to a larger number. Um, we had an early, I would say, glimpse um, at the promise of immunotherapy with um, a fairly old-fashioned therapy called Hydros Interleukin-2 um, that, by the way, um, is still being used today um, and uh, still cures patients today at UT Southwestern and, um, and other major academic centers. Um, although those therapies are also evolving, converging, um, and, uh, and I think um, they're really promising times with regards to increasing the effectiveness of uh, these therapies. Wrapping up, uh, Dr. Margulis, um, um, does this uh, study have uh, any uh, implications with respect to uh, the importance of a team approach uh, to patient management. This study, I mean, doesn't change, uh, in my opinion, the current standard of care. Um, um, it highlights the importance of patient selection. It highlights the importance of having a multidisciplinary team that assesses and evaluates the patient and comes up with a with a treatment plan. Um, and I think the success uh, in this field is determining which patient would benefit from systemic therapy only versus patients that would benefit from a combined approach. And I think. Um, I'm lucky enough to work in a center where we have people that dedicate their lives and careers to, to treatment of this disease, and I think that that certainly translates into the improved outcomes for our patients. I, I would just strongly echo what, what Dr. Magulis has, has said. Um, again, I, I'm deeply convinced that um, care is best delivered uh, and planned, um, um, if you will, at a large volume center. Um, and. Um, if you look at comparison data from uh, community practices or major academic centers, um, typically patients fare uh, clearly better um, at major academic centers. Um, I think it's a privilege uh, to work uh, with um, a team of people who are showing clinical uh, and research excellence uh, throughout. Um, and um, I can only advise uh, patients if they are being diagnosed with any cancer um, to really seek out at uh, centers of um, excellent, um, uh, of excellence uh, and specialized care. In summary, we would like to commend the investigators for attempting to address an important question uh, and by providing evidence um, that it speaks to the role of removing the primary tumor in the kidney in patients with metastatic disease. And this has been a very substantial effort. We also like to commend uh, the patients for willing to be involved uh, in this study and allowing themselves to be randomized to either having surgery or not surgery, a difficult decision for, for many people. I would uh, like to conclude uh, just simply by stating the importance of uh, a, a team approach. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Margulis, and thank you very much, Dr. Hammers, uh, for, for spending the time with us and, and sharing your perspective on this important uh, study with, uh, with our patients and our audience.